Well, this evening, we're going to do our best to finish out the eighth beatitude. And as we, we look at that, that'll be in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 to 12, the blessed are the persecuted. And, it, and I think very fitting that Jesus would work his people, specifically those who are gathered around them. They're not grounded. They've been led astray in so many ways by the religious institution around them to bring them from the point of being poor in spirit, understanding their, their, their need for Christ, all the way down as he works on their character to the point of where they're willing to suffer for Christ. I can tell you growing up, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and, and little by little, I wasn't, it was very little by little, after many years, it's with joy I can say that much of my family did come to know Christ. Uh, my mom, eventually, my, my alcoholic abusive father came, came to Christ. Still waiting for my brother Pete. You can be in pray, prayer for him. But I watched my grandmother, who once walked wonderfully with the Lord, come to that point. My pap, who wanted nothing to do with it, eventually, a couple years before the end of his life. So I, I can say it was with joy to see it happen, but it didn't start there. And so when I started going, and I really went because Gladys Tree Week, I started going to, to church on Sunday mornings after uh, starting with Bible school at the Millray CMA. And they had a bus that they come pick up a bunch of us about 60 to 70 kids, they filled that thing. And then there was a, a Dodge minivan that they used to pick the Valley kids up on Sunday morning. And Gladys Tree Week um, would always be there with her bubblelicious bubble gum. And that was incentive enough for me to want to go to church every Sunday morning. Because if you went up to Gladys Tree Week, old Gladys, she, she, she was no taller than this. But that lady had a heart big as gold and she'd just give you as much gum as you wanted to take. But I can tell you the teaching was strange for me at first. When I'd have Sunday school teachers, and I can remember times youth group leaders, and even the pastors he preached, and, and as they talked about, especially when you read Acts chapters 4 and 5, people literally rejoicing for being abused. And, and understand the framework of where my mind's coming from. I can't tell you I ever rejoiced being abused as a kid growing up. In, in fact, I can remember, and I shared this with you, the second helping I got from my mom because she accidentally, mistakenly thought I was mocking her when I thanked her for disciplining me. And I only did what my Sunday school teacher told me. I didn't want round one, let alone round two, and I definitely wasn't grateful for it. And so to hear people talking that there were grown men who were excited to be beaten for the name of Christ didn't make sense to me. It wasn't until I began to really grow in my relationship with Christ and, and even into my te upper teens uh, through Bible college that I really started to get a grasp for what it meant to suffer persecution. And I can tell you, in light of the, the missionaries who are serving uh, you know, in our stead, those that, that we support and even those that we don't that are on the front lines, I can tell you to a great degree I've never really experienced the persecution that many Christians have been called to in this world. And I'd like to say that a majority of the American church would probably be able to say the same. But our role as we go through the Beatitudes is, is Christ lays out this foundation is that you and I would be prepared when that time comes. And my prayer is that we would be. And so even though as I grew up, I didn't want that to be a part. I didn't want to get persecuted at home, let alone through the church. And yet as we've gone through this study, we get to verse 10. And we've talked about this blessed thing, exceeding, abundantly, fully joyful and happy. What if I said, are the, the wealthy and the loaded down? The carefree and the burdenless. You'd be like, hey, sign me up. That sounds blessed. And when you hear it from the lips of Jesus, we probably should really stop to think about what he's saying here. Fully, completely, exceedingly, abundantly, joyful and blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you. That, that means to defame you. It means to, to tear you down, to drag your name, as good as it may be, to drag it through the mud. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. It's not even true. We've talked about the last couple of weeks about what it feels like to, to go through that. Remember, like, who told you that? None of that was true. And Jesus says, when they speak evil against you falsely, for my sake. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And, and it, so at first glance, as, as I know, as I heard this, there were certain things that I picked out. Blessed are the ones who are persecuted, reviled, evilly spoken against, lied about, bad-mouthed, falsely accused. And, and you know, who wants to rejoice over that? <laughs> Sign me up. No. We have to look at it in context. As we look at the persecution, verse 10 talks about, it's for righteousness sake. A, a righteous stand before God and before man when, when we're living to the best of our ability through the Holy Spirit's power to live out the word of God. We're standing in righteousness. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted when they're living the right way. And the reviling, the evil and false speaking, it, it's when it's levied against you for Christ's name's sake. You know, one of the things that I wanted to know when I went into my freshman year at college and I, and I met with Dr. Joyce Hulgus, especially as, as I wrestled with some of the things I'd been through as a kid in, in light of the, 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 the meaning of the gospel, I remember saying to Dr. Hulgus, I want to know that this pain has been worth it. Because I really needed help to see that there was purpose behind the pain. And over four years, my professor and my advisors were very good at helping me find that that pain could be repurposed, that there was a purpose. And you and I can find that in the midst of the press of serving Christ and the persecution that can and will come our way, listen, if you stand in any way against this fallen world, do not think that, that you will be exempt from the persecution that comes with it. You will not. Somebody asked me, and I adamantly agree, this is the only way. Someone asked me about 10 years ago, going through a hard church situation, Pastor Scott, what is the only way that we won't have to face this? I said, do nothing of kingdom value. Close the book, close the doors, stay in your house, and do nothing of kingdom value, and the enemy will let you alone. But the moment you take a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are a fish swimming up against the stream. And the world will come at us. But we can find that there is a significant purpose behind that. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight, number one, is, is consider the point of what we're going through. Because there is a big difference. Listen, I, I have faced the wrath of Deb Decker needfully, and I faced the wrath of Deb and actually Charlie Decker needlessly. I didn't do it. I got in trouble whether it was something my brother did or they were mistaken. But I can tell you, if I put it in, in two hands, the times I got in trouble needfully far outweighs the accidents when I get smoked for no good reason. And there is a difference between suffering in this world because of what you bring on yourself and what I bring on myself. And suffering for the kingdom's sake. And so in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 16, it says, Beloved, and, and understand, Peter is talking to a church. They're not living in the lap of luxury. Uh, they're not even in a nice new building like we are tonight. This is a church that is scattered throughout Asia Minor, the five provinces. They, they are scattered everywhere. These are people, men and women, who have trusted Christ. And as a result, husbands have thrown their wives and children out. As a result, men have lost their jobs, their employment, and, and, and with losing your livelihood, they've lost a place to live. Their own government has started to turn. And so people are getting pressed out of their area because of persecution. And so in the midst of this, this isn't like somebody picked on me at work. 
Or, or somebody put a sticky note on my back, you know, kick stupid. You know, th this isn't what we're talking about. Real life persecution was happening for these folks. And I need texts like this to remind me to get myself out of my pity party that's not all about me. It's all about him and his glory. And I've seen nothing yet. But when it comes from the pen of someone who died as tradition holds upside down on a cross, maybe Peter knows a little something about persecution. And is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. What does Peter say to the church that God has preserved for you and I? He says, Beloved, do not be surprised. I shared this morning, when we start letting in a theology that somehow we can avoid as the church any kind of persecution, backlash, struggle, trial, or strife, standing for the kingdom's sake, we are genuinely foolish if we believe that. And, and I'll share with you a little bit more in a little bit. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery orde ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing. He says, as though some strange thing were happening to you. I'd like to say, listen, remember, this isn't something that should catch you off guard as a Christian. He says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. You, you know, when I read that, I think of Paul. Paul says, I, I want to know him. And that's what I want to know tonight for me. Do I really want to know who Christ is? Or do I want a God of my own making? He will approve the things that I want to do. Stroke my ego. Tell me I'm a good boy. Maybe be my genie or my sugar daddy. To give me what I want. Or as a willing vessel at times that's going to be beautifully broken. Do I humble myself at his feet, the one who has bought me? who's paid for me, who has redeemed and restored me. And even if it means knowing him through the fellowship of his sufferings, as Paul says, says, here I am, Lord, use me. He says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, and I think this is cool because Peter spent a lot of time with Jesus. He says, keep on rejoicing. You know, as you're going through that heated trial, and as you're getting pressed from every side because of your stand for Christ, he says, keep on rejoicing. Why? Because we just sang it. What a day that will be. This trial isn't going to last forever. It isn't all that there is. There is an end in sight. And there's not just hope at the end. There's hope through, as he says this, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You're not an orphan through it. He's not left you alone. He's not abandoned you. And listen, I can tell you there is a purpose even through the pain. And I can tell you when we're willing and when we're open, and even when we don't understand, God really can repurpose the pain to use it for his glory and for our good. But verse 15, as I said, there's a difference between the suffering that we'll face because of our righteous stand for Christ and the suffering that we face and we deserve because of going against him. Verse 15, he says, Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. He says, so, listen, I'm not talking about when you suffer because you've asked for it. And I'm not talking about, you know, when you face consequences because of your sin. You should, and so should I. It's what helps us to grow. We've deserved it. We've asked for it. He says, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. In John 16, verses 1 to 4, and, and I love Jesus doesn't leave us like on alert. It's like, what do, what do we expect? He says what we can expect. And the longer I serve him, the more I realize that this broken world, it's not that it hates me. 
In fact, it's not even that it opposes me. It opposes the one who has set me free, the very one that can set them free. And in John 16, verse 1, Jesus says, These things I have spoken unto you that you should not be offended. That means to fall away. And can I tell you, if you read John chapter 6, when Jesus gets to the nitty-gritty, and and I've said this in in a session in my office this week, someone from outside the church, you can't avoid the persecution of standing for the cross. If you take a stand for Jesus Christ, you will face it. You can't get away. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how influential you are. I don't care how many top-selling books you sell. I don't care if you have the biggest church in North America. You can say what you want to say, but God's word has the final word. And Jesus says this, these things I have spoken unto you that you should not be offended. You read the end of John chapter 6, and there were many who liked the bread. There were many who liked the good things that could come from hanging out with the Christians. There were many who liked the status maybe they could get by hanging out with this new rock star, Jesus Christ. But when the rubber met the road and the sacrifice was called for, they turned to follow Jesus no more. And there is a church filled with that voice today. Not turning hearts toward the sacrifice and the cost that the cross calls for. But somehow thinking that even though Jesus couldn't, we could escape it and live a life of ease. And Jesus lovingly shares with his disciples, they shall put you out of the synagogues. There was no place soon found for the early church to meet. We're going from house to house because they couldn't go in the synagogue. He said, yes, the time comes that whoever, whosoever kills you will think that he is doing God's service. And he said, and these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. As I thought about what Jesus said, I mean, I I can't read through the entire New Testament, and I can't come up with a doctrine of theology that says that, that there's some kind of gospel without suffering. I can't read the Word of God and somehow come out and think that there's, there's a message that I can preach that somehow I can tell you that you can avoid, you can remove, you can eliminate, uh, that, that you and I can minimize or get rid of the suffering that the Christian life calls you to. I, I can't come out with that. I told you if we wanted to fill this building in the next month, we could do it. We could do it. And they're doing it nationwide. But the message that requires, I can't find in the truth of the Word of God. I'd love to tell you that you stand for Christ, it'll be peaches and cream the rest of your life. I can't do that. And in love, Jesus told us in advance. So is that we wouldn't, as Peter said, be surprised at the ordeal that we're in the midst of. But if you want to hear it from the mouth of Peter again, and listen, this is one of those double take moments. Do you want to know what you were called to as a Christian? And these aren't Pastor Scott's word verbatim from the word of God. As Peter has already levied against them, don't don't be surprised when this happens. In chapter 2, verses 21 to 25, he says, For even hereunto were you called. That is the effectual call to salvation. God has called you to be redeemed. And listen to what it goes on to say. He says, for even hereunto, what's he talking about? Suffering, persecution, taking a stand for the gospel, advancing into a world that's adverse to it. He said, because Christ also suffered for us. Listen, leaving us an example, that is a pattern of imitation. He says, Jesus Christ suffered as he advanced the kingdom, as he established the kingdom, and he's called you to do the same. So brothers and sisters, if I ever tell you something adverse to that, And I can assure you, if you try to tell me something the verse that let us lovingly come alongside of each other and stop that and nip that right at the bud. He says he's left us an example that you should follow his steps. 
And when that trial comes, I love this. Peter, as, as these believers are hurting, listen, you would think this is so unloving. Peter, they're hurting. They're, they're cast out of their homes. Their spouses want nothing to do with them. There are children who are orphaned. I mean, tell them it's going to all be okay. Peter doesn't tell them how to avoid it. He rather tells them how they can embrace it, endure it, and even thrive victoriously through it. He said that Jesus is our example, our pattern. So what did Jesus do? Verse 22, he who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. I mean, you want to talk about not fair? I can't tell you how many times, God, this isn't fair. Why are you allowing me to go through this? Why can't I just grow up in a normal family? Why can't my dad come home like other people's dads come home? And when he does, why does it have to be the way that it is? You know, I talk about fair. But then I read this. No sin. No guile. When he was defamed, he didn't, re- he didn't defame in return. And when he suffered, he threatened not. The holy, sinless, righteous Son of God suffered unfairly, cruelly. And do you know what he did? He committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were a sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And and so what we have to do, I, I don't fully understand it. Maybe it's not fair, but how do I endure? How do I thrive? How do I embrace? I look to the Father. And so our second point, we consider the purpose of what we're going through. And and as you read the truth of the scriptures, and and, and listen, I know it's like a a children's storybook picture, Jesus sitting and the people at the the, the Mount of Capernaum standing around him, and and he's teaching these lost sheep, these sheep that are scattered, and, and he's showing them what the character of a kingdom citizen looks like. And as he's developing that character, as that narrative is building to the point, he's like, as much as I love you and as much as I paid for you, I can't keep you from going through this. Because as the salt of the life of the earth, salt and the light of the earth, this is what you've been called to. And as you study in the scripture, those, and I'm not talking those who make a name for themselves. I'm talking about those who made much of Jesus. And they're not telling me and filling my head with prosperity and blessing, and health, and wellness, as if that is the end gate of the Christian life. And I'm not saying it can't be a part of it, but it's not. It's my salvation. It's the salvation of the lost for the glory of God. And those who genuinely wielded this sword were willing to suffer horrific persecution. And there are times, even as a pastor, I'm not willing to give up time in my schedule, let alone hang upside down on the tree. In John 16, like I said, Jesus lovingly shared with his followers. He said, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace would be to God that is tempting as it is to look to the things of the world. We we would look to him, to God and his word, to the precious Holy Spirit's power to find the peace that's there. 
Because in the world you have tribulation, but take courage. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. John 15, 18, it says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. In 2 Timothy 3, 12 to 13, it says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It doesn't get any clearer than that. And here's why. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Some of you are like, I just want to go home and watch the Super Bowl right now, Pastor Scott, and this is, this is raining on my parade. Let me cast a little sunshine for you. Not only did Jesus predict that it would happen, there's good news in what it means. Look back at verse 10. Look at what it shows the world around us. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, if you want to show a sin-sick, sin-stained, darkness-filled world what the child of God looks like, then, then you rise up and shine in the strength of God in the midst of the press of persecution. And listen, we can't get away from it. In fact, I, in that regard, I appreciate an explanation that, that as you and I are persecuted by the world as we stand for Christ, I appreciate this explanation given by John Piper in his Desiring God message, and it was titled, Blessed are the Persecuted. Is it an exhaustive list? No. But this should be what the child of God looks like versus the world around us. And listen, if this is you and I striving to, to live this way, we're going to face. You're going to know the why. What's the purpose of the suffering? It's because you and I are not of this world. He, Piper goes on to say, if you cherish moral purity, it is lost in this society today. And I'm just going to go ahead and say, it's even lost in the body and the bride of Christ today. How do I know it? Listen to the coarse joking. Look at the sin that's not only tolerated, it's embraced in the, in, in the body of Christ. Piper said, if you cherish moral purity, your life will be an attack on people's love for unbridled sexuality. He said, if you embrace temperance, your life will be a statement against the love and abuse of alcohol. If you pursue self-control, a fruit of the Spirit, your life will indict excess eating in all excesses. If you live simply and happily, you will show the folly of luxury. If you walk humbly with your God, and, and, and what does God require of us? It's in Micah 6, 8. That's what he wants. You walk humbly with your God, you will expose the evil of pride. If you are punctual and thorough in your dealings, you will lay open the inferiority of laziness and negligence. If you speak with compassion, you will throw callousness into sharp relief. If you are earnest, you will make the flippant. Flippant people are those who are disrespectful and have no regard for seriousness in, in a serious matter. Everything's a joke. If you're earnest, you will make the flippant look flippant instead of clever. And if you are spiritually minded, you will expose the worldly mindedness of those around you. Is Piper right? In John 3, 19 and 20. Jesus says this to Nicodemus. This is the condemnation. This is the verdict. That light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. For everyone that does evil hates what? The light. Neither comes to the light. Why? Lest his deeds should be reproved. Next time, we're going to look at the last point. We're going to consider the promise that's given to those who are willing to suffer for Christ. But as we close here, thinking about darkness, hating light, not wanting exposed, I will never forget, as a sophomore or junior in high school, when, in fact, I got to meet one of the young men who said that at the Bearcat basketball game on Friday night. And this man's life has changed drastically since he made this statement. 
And actually, his life was changed because of what he was doing in the moment when he said this. He said, Scott, or they called me Decker. Decker, it'd be so much easier to keep doing what I'm doing if you'd do it with me. I said, not a chance. Remember I talked about getting smoked by Deb Decker? The fear of Deb Decker. The pulpit. There we go. Listen, you're going to like this. You can't see this. This clock says 7.30, and I really thought, Dan, you messed with me. I told Dan when it's 7.30, just shut the sound system off. <laughs> we have a God of a great sense of humor, don't we? Or terrible Duracell batteries, one of the two. But you heard what my friend said. If you would do this with me, I'd feel a whole lot better. You know what the darkness was saying? I don't want called out into the light. So if the light's darkness, what does the scripture say? How dark is that light? Listen, that applies to so many things. I said it this morning. Whether it's the false teaching someone tries to bring to the forefront of your attention, you're like, wait, first of all, who told you that? Where'd you find that in scripture? Or the next time someone says to you in darkness, say, listen, did you hear what so-and-so did? Why am I talking like that? Because we sound like a bunch of preschoolers. Did you know what they did? I can't believe they would do that to me. Or I can't believe they'd do that to you. And what if the light just called it out for what it is and said, what did they do when you talked with them? The darkness doesn't like being exposed by the light, but guess what? You got an eternal flashlight empowering you from the inside out. Let it shine. And, and here's the thing, as you take that stand, listen, I guarantee you, you watch the Super Bowl and you go home, you have all kinds of opportunities to stand against the fallen world. And you want to talk, you want to see how callous you are, just see how funny those Super Bowl ads are. I'm not being judgmental, I'm just saying, watch your eyes, children. Watch your eyes and guard your heart. And listen, when you take that stand for Christ this week, the opportunities will come. We're going to talk next week. There is a promise given to those who are willing to stand boldly for Christ. Father, we come to you this evening and we thank you for the truth of your word. We can't ever thank you enough for that. I thank you for those, I think of William Tyndale, the William Tyndale who gave his life. And I don't mean just gave his life in time, and he did for years. In fact, even when he got shipwrecked and lost the entire body of work that he had completed to that point, the man went from house to house, corner to corner, translating this Bible, the, the Latin, into the common man's language so we could have it. And then literally lost his life for doing so. I thank you that you have preserved this and that there are those who have suffered to get it into my hands. And Father, I'm asking you to give me and my brothers and sisters a resolve as strong to take a stand for you. And Lord, encourage us to know that there is a rich reward. And it may not be financial. It may not be in prosperity or health or wellness. But it is eternal. that never fades and can never be snatched away. Father, may we fix our eyes on that prize in Jesus' name. Amen.